Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Duda. I'm uh, Managing Director of EBOS. Welcome to the first part of uh, our series on uh, BPIR regulations, which come into force in December this year. Uh, we've got over 200 of us on the call today, so we appreciate if everyone could just mute their microphones, um, and that'll make sure that uh, all the speakers have clear ear. Um, with me today, I've got John, Nancy, uh, and Dom in the background. Um, they'll be managing the chat line. Um, and if you can just make sure that no one's caught up in the waiting room uh, team, that would be excellent. All right, today uh, we have got a busy session and we should get straight into it. So over the next three weeks, we have an objective to provide some real clarity around these new regulations um, and make sure that you're aware of all the support that is available uh, for you to complete your BPIR disclosure statements, uh, which will be enforceable as of December this year. Uh, with that in mind, um, we have three 60-minute sessions and not only are we going to provide an overview, but we are going to take you through the particular sections of the disclosure statements for you to draft and develop your own. Again, we um, got our some audio, including our very own software that is available. Uh, I think as a, as a industry, the supply network needs to see this as an opportunity to provide good quality, really technical information to consumers of our products. And so we'll be reiterating what best practice looks like uh, and how we can best achieve that. Uh, today, we'll also talk about um, what happens after December, um, particularly around the enforcement powers. So how these regulations will actually be managed in the market. And we'll provide some um, clear questions to your answers. Many of you have contacted us in preparation for this session to go over the, uh, to, you know, to, to go over the um, particular details around how um, compliant, what compliance should look like. All right. In terms of um, our outlines over the next three weeks, we'll have one hour session every Tuesday at one o'clock. We'll be running on Zoom as we are now. Um, if you do have questions, um, I hope you're all familiar with chat functions, so we won't be taking raised hands or verbal questions. If you can just use the chat function, which we're constantly monitoring. Uh, at the end of uh, each session, uh, we'll have some to-dos, um, so some preparation for the following week. And um, with that in mind, if you've got, um, if you feel you miss anything, after each session, we'll be making um, the recordings publicly available on the EBOS website. And our intention is that at the end of the three sessions, you will have developed your own draft disclosure document. With that in mind, um, today we're going to be just going over the BPIR uh, regulations. Now, our expectation is that you are obviously aware this is happening that also you've read the um, guidance documents that the MB team have put out and also had a look at the exemplars and templates. So we won't be covering that in any detail. We're looking at um, specific questions that have been uh, we've fielded over the last few weeks. Next week, we'll be uh, looking at how building products relate to the building code, in particular, how to clearly state a scope of use and conditions of use and identify performance clauses that you should be referencing within your yeah, paper documents. And finally, in session three, we'll be looking at um, finalizing your document, um, in particular, looking at the um, contact details, lots of questions around details around the manufacturer as opposed to the importer or New Zealand distributor, and how you should actually be presenting and uh, importantly, maintaining your documentation. So that's over the next three weeks. And today, um, we'll be covering off um, the general requirements um, and enforcement, who in fact is uh, impacted and who is excluded. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at our software and questions. So that's really our agenda for today. So uh, to, to kick off, I'd like to introduce um, 
Uh, we've got some senior members of the MV uh, team and uh, Lisa, Andrew, Gabrielle and Hayden, welcome. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, firstly, can we just talk to the um, timeframes we need to be acting on? Gabrielle, um, hoping you can cover uh, this and also uh, we can look at our uh, exemplars or just reference the templates that are in place. Excellent. Um, thanks, Matt. Like, so timeframes for our information and education program. So we've actually broken it here at MB into three phases. So the first phase is awareness, which we're in at the moment, July to August 23. And the key message is that we'd love you to go into building.gov.nz forward slash BPIR. And you should be able to find everything you need to comply with the building regulations on that um, on the page. We also um, at this awareness stage are encouraging people to go into building.gov.nz to subscribe to our site so we can keep you updated on any information regards to BPIR over this um, time period. Um, phase two is education, late August to late October. And phase three is urgency, late October to early December. And then on the 11th of December, 2023, the new regulations for building products information will commence. Great, thanks, Gabrielle. Um, Lisa, can we um, can I hand over to you now in terms of thinking about that sort of, I suppose, more specifics around the overview and also the enforcement um, plans? Yes, that's quite a good segue for me actually, because um, I just I'm just going to give a wee bit of a scene setter again, um, and just leading on from what Gabrielle said. It's really important to remember that the regulations only apply to um, designated building products that are manufactured in or imported into New Zealand on or after the 11th of December 2023. So that would be my first point. And then thinking about where that onus lies, it's on the manufacturers and import importers to collate and produce the required product information and disclose it online in a way that is free of charge to the public. And it's your responsibility to decide if the regulations apply to you and your building products, and then to decide what class your building products fall into, whether that's a class one or a class two. And the best approach for you to support this decision-making process is to follow through the steps that we've got in our guidance, as Matt, both Matt and Gabriel mentioned. We step you through those different steps to making that decision. It's also probably timely for me just to remind everyone about Section 14G of the Building Act, which outlines your responsibilities as a building product manufacturer or supplier. You're responsible for ensuring that the product will, if installed in accordance with the technical data, plans, specifications and advice prescribed by the manufacturer comply with the relevant provisions of the building code. And the person who supplies a building product is responsible for ensuring that they comply with the building product information requirements from the 11th of December. You're also going to be responsible for keeping that building product information up to date. And that includes updating information to address any relevant material changes to the regulations, building code, compliance pathways, or significant changes to the product. And, and you can have a look at page 19 of our guidance regarding that versioning of, of your product information. So you'll be wanting to work with retailers and distributors to make sure that information is disclosed when the product is offered for supply for class one products and for class two products that it's disclosed before the products are available for order by a client. You cannot supply sell a product that does not meet requirements. So moving on to enforcement, um, I actually work in the building system assurance team at MB, so my primary focus is around compliance and enforcement. So um, I've got my little compliance and enforcement hat on when I talk about this. So we're going to be responsible for enforcing these requirements from the 11th of December this year. So we will be um, both receiving complaints like we already do about building products, but we'll also be monitoring the market as well. We uh, have a, actually have a small team of investigators. Some of you might not realize that, that we already do have a team of investigators. 
So they'll be working in this area as well. So the primary enforcement powers in this area are our ability to issue a notice to take corrective action. So that's sort of the, the, sort of the starting point really, I guess. And it's um, an offence not to comply if you receive one of these notices. We'll also have the ability to issue an infringement notice. And there is also a prosecution offence attached to the building product information requirements as well. You may also be aware that we already have the ability to um, investigate and prosecute for false, misleading and unsubstantiated claims about building products. So we've had that ability for a, a short while now since last year. So that'll be another offence and penalty that works in tandem with the building product information requirements. Great, thank That's you. In a nutshell. Yes, no, thank you, thank you, Letha. Uh, now, just moving on, um, we now want to uh, just talk through who, who in fact is impacted. You touched a little bit on this before, uh, but if you can, uh, if you want to add any further comments around um, the Im impact, uh, in fact, we've had um, one question here, is there a chance these regulations could change if there's a change of government? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I think it would take, take them a while to actually be able to extract this out of the building code. So I suggest that would, that would uh, take a quite, a quite a while. So um, now in terms of just the, is there anything further around the criteria of um, meeting the, uh, the, or the, the BEEPA criteria, I should say? Yeah, I mean, I could have a quick chat about the exemptions because that's something I didn't talk about. And there are some exemptions to the building product information requirements. If you want more detail um, on pages eight to nine of our guidance, but um, I'll just do a very quick nutshell run through these as well. So if you've got a building product that's registered under the code mark scheme, uh, that is exempted from the product information requirements. However, if you also supply and sell other products that are not covered by that certificate, those products are most likely subject to the building product information requirements. You'll need to have a think about that. Uh, building product that's a modular component um, manufactured product um, by a registered modular component manufacturer, that's a bit of a mouthful, is also um, exempted. That, for some of you, may not know much about that area. That's our new built ready um, scheme. Someone's just asked about a uh, watermark. No, that's not that doesn't create an exemption um, under the um, requirements. So it's just code mark and a product that's under the modular component manufacturers scheme, which is built ready. Um, any temporary products such as barriers or nets that are used during demolition or construction, where they don't form part of the building when the construction's completed. Um, frames and trusses manufactured in a different location from the building site where they're to be installed. Uh, a building product that's a gas appliance or fitting and a building product that is an electrical appliance or fitting. So I'm just getting distracted by the, <laughs> the questions what, that are popping up. Yes. So that, that's the exemption. So of course you will need to consider when you're looking at whether your product is subject to these requirements or not, then you'll need to go through those exemptions and consider those. Yes. I think it's great to see these questions coming through. So, um, yep, please uh, send them and, and we'll be looking at those in the background. So, Lisa, just with that, um, uh, we talked about the exemptions. Um, mm -hmm. what, what guidance do you give people around whether they uh, they feel that if they're not certain if their product um, is, does require a BPI disclosure statement? What, what advice do you give them in terms of how they can assess um, whether in fact they do, it's it's something that falls on them or they're excluded. Yeah, so I think it's really important to work through that guide, the guidance that we have on our website. So we step you through that process of making that assessment. So we recommend that you do that. Obviously, there are other um, things out in the market that you could consider as well. And I'm assuming that if you're here today, you're probably going to be stepping through this process using the software. So that could be another way that could help support you make those decisions as well. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, now, I've actually just got a, um, I want to get some feedback uh, from everyone today. So I'm actually just going to launch a quick poll. 
and you should see that popping up on your screen. There's three very brief questions. Um, just like to get a, an idea of how informed you feel about the uh, BPIR um, requirements. I'm interested to understand, do you need any clarification to determine further whether your products do fall under BPIR? And I'd like to get a reference around uh, your level of confidence of hitting the December deadline. Um, so uh, if you can just work on that uh, in the background, we'll publish those results um, a little bit later on uh, in the session. All right. Okay, in terms of uh, the next step, you should be aware that uh, on the MB website, there are templates for you to use, and there's actually exemplars as well, both for class one and class two products. There's plenty of information there around um, uh, what, uh, what constitutes class one and class two. Um, so um, that's your first port of call. Over the last uh, three and a half years, EBOS, in conjunction with John Gardner, who is the ex-determinations and insurance manager for Department of Building Housing and MB, um, have put together some software to uh, really assist um, people who are less familiar with code compliance and, um, and disclosure documents. And um, we wanted to be able to actually step you through not only just the format, but thinking about the performance requirements, particularly um, identifying the intended scope of use, potentially limitations or conditions of use, and what parts of the building code need to be considered as part of your summary statement. So we've developed a step-by-step -step guide with um, tips and examples. Uh, we believe we've covered a lot of categories, um, product categories, um, and we'd like to just spend 10 or so minutes just to show you how that software actually works uh, and how you can use it. Um, I established eBoss 17 years ago and over the last um, yeah, nearly two decades been helping product suppliers uh, with presenting their technical information. And we understand that putting these summaries together is often quite complex. The majority of products in New Zealand are imported as finished or include imported components. Uh, so often suppliers in New Zealand have not had a lot of experience in providing compliance uh, documentation. And so with that in mind, we've developed BPI ready. Uh, so um, I'd like to introduce John Allen, uh, who works uh, alongside me in EBOS, to give you all an overview um, of the BPR Ready software, which is free for you to access and use. So um, we hope it'll be a, a great tool uh, for most of you. John, um, welcome. Uh, look, forward to, look forward to you uh, getting into BPR Ready. Cool. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, look, as Matt mentioned, I'm Jonathan, and I'm the head of uh, digital here at EBOS. And uh, yeah, look, we're pretty excited to be able to uh, offer this software tool called BPIR Ready uh, to you. We hope it's of uh, some value. Uh, and what I'm going to do now just over the next 10 minutes is show you just what it looks like and take you through the first steps of setting up a BPIR summary. Before I do that though, I just wanted to quickly uh, confirm what the tool is and what it isn't. Uh, BPI Ready is an online tool for people like yourselves, manufacturers and importers of building products to prepare what we are calling a BPIR summary. You might call it a BPA summary if you want. I'll, I'll forgive you there, we like both. Uh, it's available for free at bpir.nz. Um, you just need to sign up to be able to uh, save what you're working on. We will be emailing out a link to this after uh, the seminar, so you don't have to rush there now. Uh, and what the tool does is it helps you put together the relevant BPIR disclosure information for your product. Uh, with a little magic source. So what Matt was mentioning, it uh, generates relevant building code clauses and specific writing tips for your type of product. 
uh, using our category system. So it's almost like you had an all-knowing omniscient consultant uh, like John Gardner, who we've worked with, at your site. Uh, in terms of what it's not, I just want to make it clear that BPI already is not a public repository or database of this product disclosure information. So the summaries that you work on here, they're private, they're secure to your login. Uh, and just think of it like you're creating draft disclosure information that you can then take away at the end and publish yourself uh, you know, as you see appropriate. So uh, let's get going. Uh, mentioned the domain name bpir.nz. Uh, I'm at the get started uh, step here. I've kind of clicked the button. You can uh, sign up if you're not, uh, if you haven't signed up. Uh, I'm going to uh, hit the create a summary link here, but we do have a few other pages on the website um, that give you a bit of an overview of the regulations, some FAQs. I see some of you sending through some uh, questions in the chat line now. Maybe we're covering some of those, hopefully. Uh, so check out that information <laughs> as well. But right now, I'm just going to take you through... Uh, just the first steps of creating a summary. So I've already signed up, so I'm going to log in. And we're at the first step of the tool, which is choosing a category. Uh, over on the left, you can see that there's sort of progress steps, um, the remaining steps we have to go through uh, to complete our uh, summary. And in the select category area, this is sort of where you start off and choosing uh, one of these categories from our, our, uh, our set. And like Matt said, we think we're covering uh, most major products here. Uh, when you choose one of these, it's going to apply a bunch of building code clauses, which you can see here, a bit of a definition of what the category covers, what it, what it doesn't cover. And when I toggle to show more details, we can see that uh, this is uh, automatically applying a set of clauses from the building code that are relevant to this category. And what it's also going to do further on is it'll uh, generate some specific tips for the written sections of the disclosure information. So your product description, scope of use, conditions of use. Now, if you can't find an appropriate category uh, for your product, uh, we do have an uh, other category that you can uh, utilize. This isn't going to generate any building code clauses, but you can still uh, go through the other steps of the tool, fill in the written sections, and we actually have some generic writing tips for those sections um, that could probably help you out there as well. For today, I'm going to go with uh, wall cladding. And I'll move on to the next step. Uh, which is just asking me a few questions about the product suitability for additional applications that are going to influence these building code clauses uh, for my product. So not every category will have this, but most do. And based on my responses to the questions, the tool is going to append some new building code clauses or remove some of those default ones on the cladding category. Uh, we're on no by default. Um, so this Category cladding has two questions. Uh, is the cladding, is my cladding product suitable to be used on walls closer than one meter to a relevant boundary? I'll hit yes there. And if I just toggle show more details, I can see that it's going to append the clause C3.7. So that's relating to fire. Uh, I'll do the same with the second question uh, relating to uh, the wall height that it's used on. We can see again, it's another um, C3 clause that's being appended there because I've answered yes uh, to that. We've also got a few um, definitions uh, of terms, as you'll see as you move through the tool. So uh, you can toggle over uh, those underlined words and you get a bit of a definition um, from uh, building code or uh, some other terms we have in there. So yes, yes, I'm continuing. And we're now at the product name step. So I can choose what class my product fits into. 
Um, we have a bit more information on that if you're un unsure. Um, Clavian is a class one product, so I'm going to choose uh, that. And I'll uh, throw in a fictional one here. I've been watching the Arnie uh, documentary on Netflix, so I'm going to go homage to his first film, Hercules. Hercules Weatherboard, and I've got a product identifier here um, as if it's a model number uh, for that product. I continue on, and we're on to the uh, step where you write your product description. And this is where we start to see the writing tips come into play. Here we have a bit of information at the top about what a description is and what it isn't from the perspective of um, BPIR. And as I scroll down to green here, uh, what we also have are some specific writing tips based on my selected category of wall cladding. So it's letting me know that my description should cover uh, the following items. It should cover the intended use of the cladding, the composition, uh, system compatibility, dimensional variance, and any other relevant properties as well, with, um, with some sort of prompts on what those might be. And if I scroll down a bit, it's also letting me know anything else I should be adding to my description because of the way I answered those additional use questions earlier. So uh, one item here, um, because I pointed out that the product is suitable for use on walls closer than one meter from a relevant boundary, it's suggesting that I add that into my description. And I can toggle show more details just to see why that's being suggested to me. Uh, it's because I answered yes there. Okay, and if we head down a bit further, we've got the uh, text editor where I input my written description when I'm ready. And there's an example I can click here, which uh, pops up, close these tips, uh, that we've already prepared based on this category, but also on the additional use response. So uh, that's fictional, obviously, but it just allows you to preview uh, what we have sort of had in the writing tips earlier in an actual written paragraph format. So, um, you know, you don't, you're not going to want to copy and paste that uh, and just change your product name, obviously, but it gives you an idea of uh, how to go about writing that. Uh, also just wanted to point out, we've got a text editor here is what's called a markdown editor. Uh, we've chosen that because it allows you to copy and paste from anywhere with full impunity. So you're not going to put any gunk in there that often comes from copying and pasting rich text from other websites or Google Docs. So markdown is a form of plain text uh, where you can add any basic formatting that will eventually render as clean HTML from the nerdy dev point of view. All you need to know is uh, bullet points are probably the only thing you're going to want to put in here. Uh, there's a bit of a short format for that. When you click the bullet points, you get that there. So look, it's just adding a dash. Uh, when when that gets through to the final review and finish step, you'll see that those kind of render as nice little bullet points. So of course, this is just a draft. And you know, when you take this away, if you're someone who likes to go renegade with bold text and other things, you can you can do that uh, yourself once you've um once you've uh, finished and downloaded it or copied it into your own uh, publishing software. So let me throw some description text in here quickly before we wrap up. All right, I prepared that one earlier. I'll move through uh, move through here where we will uh, stop for now. Um, we can pick this up again next week. Uh, I just wanted to show you that what I've done so far has actually saved, and I can click on my uh, little uh, user menu up here, and I can go to my BPR summaries. And Herc is in there, ready for me to continue whenever I want to. So I can hit edit, and I'm back into it, remembered where I was up to. So that's a bit of an intro uh, to BPI Ready. Uh, I'll pause there, as there is more to cover next week, and throw it back to you, Matthew. Great, thank you very much there, John. Uh, 
So I just want to reiterate what John has shown us. He's actually uh, taken us into the tool, he's logged in, and he's set up his first uh, BPIR summary. Uh, and in doing that, he's put he's selected the category that the product fits within, uh, any additional use clauses, and then started to put in some identification information. So that includes, uh, obviously, the title of the product. Um, we're going to talk about ranges in a second, um, a product identifier, and the description. So uh, with that in mind, the intention of the series is that uh, you have an objective to develop your own disclosure documents uh, for BPIR over the next three weeks. So for next Tuesday, um, we'll be sending out an email shortly with links to BPIR.nz. Um, so for you to get set up, start your first disclosure document and with that uh, you can um, obviously select the category additional use the class one or two and the product description um, and by doing that over the next week when we kick off next uh, Tuesday at one o'clock we will go into the next phase which is identifying um, the New Zealand Building Code clauses which are relevant to that category and the um, scope uh, descriptions that will be required as part of your disclosure documents. So that, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be sending out uh, information on that shortly. Now, a few questions that have come through, which I just want to quickly detail. Um, as I mentioned, uh, BPR really is free at bpir.nz. Someone's just um, asked, I've just tried to join. It says a monthly membership of $15.80. Um, no, we're not trying to um, scam you here. I think that must be bpir.com. Um, so there'll be some other websites. So please make sure you go to bpir.nz uh, and you will never be asked for money. So um, I can, it's free for you to use. Question from uh, Dan, are we responsible for updating um, with regards to building code regulation changes? Yes, um, so the, the idea with BPR Ready is that as of today, we believe that this is the best sort of guidance tool in understanding building code requirements. Um, it enables you to create your own draft document. As John mentioned, you can then download that and present that in whatever format you would like. But ultimately, this is a document that's yours. You're signing off. It's a first party statement. Um, so there'll be an expectation that um, you take full responsibility. We're really here just to help guide you to a, um, to a point where you can actually then determine all that information and sign it off um, to your requirements. Um, but it is certainly our intention to make sure that BPR Ready is updated as um, the code develops. Question from Ryan, are these effectively uh, TDSs? I'm going to pick that, Ryan, you actually meant uh, PTSs, Product Technical Statements, which was brought out by MB uh, in 2011. And the reality is this format's very, very similar. Uh, there's a couple of nuances there, particularly around contact details uh, and maintenance and, and warranty information. Um, so... You, this format should look very familiar to a number of you. Um, I think he might have meant a technical data sheet. Oh, uh, okay. T the TD is. Uh, what I would say, just <clears throat> sorry, I'm gone, gone all croaky now. Um, we, we the regulations haven't mandated how how a um, one of these disclosures has to look. So we haven't told you it has to look any particular way. It just sets out the what sort of information must be provided. So you might find, and our guidance talks about this, you may have some of this information already. And so you might choose to just add on to what you already have on your website, perhaps, or in a, in a technical data sheet to ensure that you've got everything, all the information that needs to meet those requirements. So it may be a case of building on something that you already have and bringing that up to the right requirements. Great. Hey, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that clarification. Also, Brendan, thank you for sending that through as well. 
Uh, so just to reiterate, there's uh, no specific format. It's just there is uh, this expected level of information um, as is set out in the templates, which BPR really covers. Uh, great, just a few other questions. Um, Brendan, the download feature. Oh, so yep, we've got people on there already. So that's great. Uh, yes, um, there is. Well, uh, Brendan, we're going to cover off um, how you can actually extract your information. Um, there's there's a number of different options. It's very easy for you to do. Rather than cover that now, um, we'll get we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, Rob, once completed, where does the disclosure document? Uh, where is it sent to? Uh, we're going to on the session three. We're going to talk about publishing uh, and making that available. So, um, the guidance documents um, state that they need to be available online and freely accessible. So there's no password protection, um, and you'll be asked by merchants if you're using retailers um, for them to be able to access your information as well. We'll cover that off in session three. So uh, go for one step at a time. Um, How do these overlap with producer statements? If we have a PS1 available online, is that sufficient to meet the new requirement? Um, we can cover that off in the question set. Hayden, can we um, can we come to that? Um, come back to that. If you can just make a mental note, uh, that that that's a good question. Though hopefully we we will cover in the questions that we do have. Um, all right. With that in mind, keep the questions coming. Um, I will uh, just move on the presentation um, and think about what we are going to cover next week. With that in mind, I'd like to bring in John Gardner. Uh, John, welcome uh, to the webinar. Um, I'll bring up um, these bullet points here. Um, John, if you can just unmute yourself and just take us through what we're actually going to cover um, in our next session on Tuesday next week. So thanks, Matt. So so next week, sort of, um, so the hand it over to um to me, and then we go through. First off, we just do a bit of a one hundred and one around the building code and the building products. There's some complexity around that, so provide a simple overview, and then we sort of go back into the to the tool um, and sort of take over from where John left off, Jonathan left off a few minutes ago, and then just talk you through about how you establish the scoping conditions of use for specific building products. And as we sort of, you've seen a little bit of exposure before, we've got some hints and some suggestions around that. And then so the, then so that, that's taking you through the, that part of the, the tool. Then we move on to just having a bit of a talking about how you um, relate your product to building code performance and how you provide evidence to support your claims of compliance. And within the, the tool, we've added in some simple explanations um, or some examples about where you can get evidence from for various code clauses. Great, thank you very much for that, John. I'd just like to reiterate that uh, John Gardner's been helping out um, product suppliers for decades uh, and has a very good understanding of the application of the building code when it comes to product and product performance. And John's been integral in helping put together um, BPR ready. Um, we just could not have done it without you. So John, thanks for your help there and, and look forward to your session next week, which we should all find extremely valuable. All right, um, we've got 20 minutes left. Um, so we've covered an overview, um, shown you the uh, the tool. Um, we've got questions coming through, which we'll, we'll reference as well from the chat line. But I'd like to now get into some questions that were um, sent through to me um, in advance of today's meeting. So uh, Lisa, Gabriel, Hayden and Andrew, um, uh, we'll we'll be throwing to you over the next 20 minutes. If we can just cover these off succinctly, um, we've got a few to get through. Um, all right, the first question is around guidance to grouping products. So are we able to, and this we've got a uh, particular question here which relates to bathroom wear, are we able to group all of our shower cubicles across all of the sizes that, are, that use the same factories for the different components? Um, I can talk about uh, grouping. 
Um, uh, if you have a look at our guidance on page 21, there's some information there about how to go about that. And I think probably the thing that is important to point out here is you will need to ensure <laughs> with your, these various products that they all, when you're grouping them, they share the same, um, I guess you could call it technical information, so the same code clause, um, requirements, installation, instructions, that sort of thing. I think it's also important to remember that the purpose of these, the product information requirements is to help people make informed decisions about building products. So just remembering the end user when you're producing product information to meet requirements, that BCAs will be using that information when they're processing consent applications and specifiers will be using that information to compare between products and helping them make decisions. So you want to make sure that the information is 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 able to be well and easily used um, by these different people. So where it might make sense not to group them because it's not easy to follow, then that might be a reason to think about that. But yes, like I said, if they have um, similar um, or the same technical um, information there, then yes, those can, could be grouped. Great. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Um, moving on here. I'm just taking a, a quote from the regulations, they only apply to building products that when used in building work may affect whether the building work complies with the building code. The guidance also states products that are bespoke one-off products are not intended to be captured by the regulations, i.e. products that are not based on a product line and are produced for a specific project. So what does that mean for kitchen bench tops as they do contribute to G3? Okay. Um, I think the answer the answer to this might depend on the nature of the kitchen bench top, whether it's something that's you you buy it off the shelf um, from Bunnings, or it, it's made from a product line, which uh, then it would be a class two product, or it's a completely bespoke one off thing that's specific design that's only used in that building, and and then it's not captured by these requirements uh, of course the intent of the requirements is actually to help people get through the consent process so it doesn't have the benefit of supporting that so it would have to have its own specific you know be part of a specific design around the consent right yeah because that i mean that's the ultimate aim for this thing is actually to help people make decisions around products including councils when they come to the consent um and if there is a, you know, it helps them also consider product substitutions after the consent's granted as well. So there's quite a, quite a few benefits in here for, for manufacturers. Okay, thank you, Hayden. Um, moving on. We sell toilets, tapware parts, um, shower slides, hand pieces, mirrors, cabinets, baths. Um, this will be uh, familiar for many of us that um, have a wide portfolio of products. Um, we service commercial, retail, and domestic purposes. Of the thousand products, how should we best determine what products fit under BPIR and require a disclosure statement? Um, I, it's Lisa here. Um, I would again work through those steps in the guidance. It, should, it steps you through each um, stage of the process. And again, if you are considering um, attending the seminars to use the tool, by the look of what's happening with that, um, I would expect you um, can get some support from there as well. But that guidance for us is, is very comprehensive, so work through that. I think that's on page eight, isn't it, Lisa? Somewhere around there. I think the... it is. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's very early on in the guidance document. Yeah, and um, for those of you that have very specific product questions uh, in session three um, with uh, Le uh, Lisa, Hayden and, and Connor, may we, I will come back and join us and we can cover off any um, further sp specific category questions that you may have. So um, if questions do arise over the next couple of weeks, um, it'll be gr great to have the MB team back here with us. Um, all right. 
So, uh, Lisa, you cover the fact that this applies to products um, that are um, stocked after the 11th of December. That's correct. There's, there's a question here. I'd like to know if there's any grace period for slow moving stock. So can we just clarify if this stock that sits that's on the shelf as of the 10th of December, it does not apply? That's correct. The requirements don't don't apply and it doesn't matter if the stock's slow moving. Um, yep. The requirements don't apply. Right. So if you're thinking about putting in um, uh, references or information on your packaging, it's really for product that will appear after the 11th of December. Um, you don't have to retrofit any packaging for product that's already um, in stock. Do mer merchants uh, need to host BPR documents? So th no. this is one of the yeah. So this is one of the questions we had from the merchant seminar, and yep. Yeah. As yeah, Lisa just said, the answer is no. This is actually this is the responsibility uh, of manufacturers and importers to produce and collate this information and make it available. Yeah. Um, just to bring in, there's a question from Chris in the chat line. So if we already have all this information available on our websites, do we still need to produce these new documents? I mean, if it's if it's all to, already all together, I mean, so we've had obviously had these kinds of questions before. You know, some people might have quite a comprehensive technical manual that has most of the information there. There's probably some bits that um, you won't have. For instance, part one of the requirements is to make a statement as to whether your product is subject to a warning or a ban. See, so most I, I I don't wouldn't think obviously we, MB's only ever issued one warning and one ban, so it's most likely the answer to that is no. But you still need to actually have that um, statement in your in your product information. So I think for if you've got to think thinking back again to the purpose of these um, regulations, which is to give people easy access to your information, uh, if if it is spread out across a number of documents, that's not probably not going to uh, make that easy for people to locate that information. So taking the opportunity to perhaps centralise that information or build on. You might have that technical manual building on that with the bits you don't already have. Could be a way of, of dealing with that too. There's nothing wrong with um, when you're covering off, you'll both probably know these um, requirements around maintenance and installation information. There's nothing wrong with linking out to an installation um, manual and a, and a maintenance manual from your product information. It doesn't mean you have to regurgitate the whole lot in, in, in your product information sheet either. So I think it's a matter of looking at what you've got, making sure that you're adding anything in there that you don't have, that you should have, and then thinking about the usability of that information and its accessibility for, for users. Does anyone else have anything they wanted to add there? Oh, Lisa, I just want to clarify that, that effectively what, what you're saying is that um, you, you're not uh, caught up on what the document is called? No, uh, and we're not caught up on what it, what it looks like. We're not telling you, but we're not giving you a, a mandatory template that you have to put it into a mandatory template. So we haven't done that. Yep. So if you can... Um, if if you can just point to a document which covers all of the required information that's laid out um, to um, it, you know that, that's expected as a disclosure document, then that's absolutely fine if that already exists. Yeah, if it meets requirements, and that's up to the manufacturer or um, importer to ensure that is that it does meet requirements. Yep. Yep. Uh, Matthew's got a question here. Will BCAs have to accept the BPIR or they ask for third party uh, verification? Uh, my understanding is a BPIR is a, is a first party statement. Will um, they, they will absolutely ask for further verification as they do with the PTS at the moment? Um, what, what, whatever they deem as um, you know as an acceptable compliance pathway is what what they'll be looking for. It may well be a brand's appraisal or code mark, uh, producer statement. Um, so my understanding is a BPIR disclosure document would not meet those requirements. It, yeah, it's not it's not the same as a code mark um, certificate, but I think the intention is um, that when you put the evidence around how your, your product, uh, how you contribute to co-compliance within its intended use, and that could be referenced to like a watermark um, certificate or something like that 
it should actually reduce the the intent is it should reduce the request for additional information that that's why we specify the fields in the way we have in the uh, the content um, to try and reduce that re request for further information from councils. Okay, thanks, Hayden. Yeah, but it, it's not the same as a Cobalt, no. I'll just I'll just keep going. Um, we've got quite a few questions here. Um, our intention is to finish at two o'clock. If we do go over slightly, for those of you who do have to leave, um, we'll have a full recording of this available this afternoon from five o'clock. Uh, but for those of you who'd like to stick with us, feel free to do so. Okay, next question. How long do we have to provide access to a BPR disclosure document for a product we have previously sold but is now uh, obsolete or no longer stocked? Yep, so uh, so if a product is superseded or taken off the market, I think manufacturers and importers will need to consider how they communicate and manage that information going forward. In our guidance, um, we suggest that manufacturers may want to keep this information around for up to 10 years. Uh, that's because that is the length of the implied warranties in the Building Act. But that's just a recommendation uh, and it's not actually a requirement of the regulations. Uh, it's just a suggestion to consider those implied warranties in the Act. Yep. Okay. How often will the BPR documents need to be updated? Yep. So, uh, one of the responsibilities under the, these regulations is that they need to be updated for the current version of the product or where there's some changes to uh, manufacturer details. So that the responsibility is on the manufacturer to update them when those changes happen. Great, thank you. So if we've, com uh, if we've completed a document, uh, is there, uh, there other completed declarations or uh, disclosure documents for us to compare against? We, we do have the, uh, the two exemplars on our on, on the building.govt website. Um, that could be something to compare against. And then- Yeah, yeah the reference was that they, was there anything else, uh, Hayden? Oh, right. At, at no. this stage that there's not? Uh, not from not from the not from the MB website, no. Okay. Uh, and is there somewhere to submit my draft declaration for checking to see if it complies? No. No, no, not for MB, there's not. No, we won't be. Um, we we just don't have the um, ability to um, to offer something like that. We're a very small team. Our focus is on monitoring and enforcement after the 11th of December. Okay, um, let's just keep going. I'll, I'll now just dip into questions from the chat line. Um, is there a possibility of the deadline being extended? The, do you mean the 11th of December deadline? Yes. To shift it? No. No, no, that's set in, in legislation. Okay. Uh, question from Ryan. If we have the compliant information on our, on our technical data sheets, then why do we need a secondary document that is just a copy of this information? Uh, like I said before, you might not necessarily need a, another document. What you could do is ensure that the information contained on your technical data sheet meets requirements. So I, um, you could take yourself through a process of and checking off and seeing what you've got that's meeting requirements and just checking to see if there's anything there that you don't have and updating it accordingly. Okay. Um... Jazz and certification scheme for products made to um, ASNZS is equivalent to Comark certification scheme. So is that a um, exemption for BPIR? I think is the question. Could you just uh, repeat that, please, Matt? I didn't catch that. Uh, Hayden, have you seen that question? It's from I, I did see that question, but I think I mean the the only exemption there is the the code mark ones. Yep. Yeah. 
And the, the certificate, if you do have code mark certification, it needs to be a registered certificate. So it needs to be on the on the um, MB code mark register. If that certificate has been suspended or revoked or withdrawn, then it isn't a registered and current and valid code mark certificate. Okay. Um, there's a uh, there's a question around um, if we uh, if, if we uh, there's no category available on um, in BPIR and therefore no associated building code clauses. Um, does that mean that we're exempt? And one thing I do want to point out on the BPR.nz uh, website is we've actually got a list of third party consultants who people can actually um, can contact if they have questions around whether their product their, their products um, uh, do fit or, or are exempt for a particular reason or if they're struggling with um, particular compliance uh, information or requirements or references to the building code. And so um, all of these websites here brands will be familiar to many of you um but we've actually got um we've got others here that um act as independent consultants that you can work with uh individually uh if you do have particular questions uh that relate to the compliance pathway um or you know further compliance or technical information that could be required um within the uh, bpir disclosure requirements so that's just, um, if you go down to the footer, you'll see third party consultants a reference down there. Okay, just uh, closing minutes. Um, let me just scroll through here. If we group products together, e.g. various sizes of the same product, what is an example of product identifier? So that that provision, uh, the disclosure needs to, the product identifier is just a way to just it's just a description or something to distinguish the product from other building products. So that, for example, in that that example that we went through earlier, I think we had the Herc, Herc um, weatherboard thing. Yeah. But I mean, for some other products, I think we, we haven't really touched on it. It could be because I think it was a question: could a barcode be a unique product identifier? And yes, it could be, uh, or a GTIN number. Yep, those could be unique identifiers as well. But we've left it up to manufacturers to, to determine how they want to do that. I think you could list a limited number of unique identifiers. Yeah, if there are three sizes of shower trays, you could have three unique identifiers. I don't see a problem with that. <laughs> yep, okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, question, this covers products as intended cover off installation of that product as well. Um, should I try and answer this? I mean, I think the answer is no. It's about installation. This is about the product itself, essentially, as it comes off the shelf and not about the installation. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. We provide bespoke Luva systems um, does each unit have to be broken down and itemized? Well, if the product is bespoke, then it's um, excluded from the requirements. So you'd have to decide, make an assessment of whether you do think it is a, a truly bespoke product. So they're what we basically say are, are one-off products. So they're not based on a product line and they're only produced for a specific building or a specific project. So again, we just encourage you to have a think about that. Um, often people are with products like that looking at whether it's bespoke or whether it's a class two. So having a look at both the guidance around both of those and just deciding which where you think that falls. That's not something we can we can tell tell you, but I think yep. yeah, have a think about that yourself. Great. I do see that it's uh, just clicked on to two o'clock. Um, it's it's a rare opportunity for us to have the MB team here. So I'm just going to keep on going and ask um, asking questions. Um, as I mentioned before, this will be recorded if you do need to shoot off. Um, otherwise, um, we'll keep going. 
Um, does this apply to products sold overseas as well as domestically? It's no, it, it applies to the New Zealand market. So products that are being sold, um, supplied and sold in the New Zealand market. Yep. Uh, does this apply to gas fittings? No. So, no. yeah, so, no, so uh, Clause 7 of the regulations talks about excluded products and electrical and gas products that are covered by the Gas and Electricity Acts and regulations are not covered because they're already covered by those other regulations. Okay, uh, grace period uh, we've talked about, it's uh, enforced as of the 11th of December, no extensions. Uh, Okay. Will MB chase up suppliers who have yet to comply? How long will we have to correct non-conformance? Well, that's a good question. I mean, our obligation um, is to enforce these, monitor and enforce these requirements from the 11th of December. Um, I mean, other than that, I can't really comment. That's just that's just um, how it works. Um, question, how do we access today's recording? Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sending out uh, an email post today um, and that recording should be available from five o'clock this afternoon. Um, question from Dave, if electric fires and gas fires are exempt, um, what about wood or bioethanol fires? Uh, so, yeah, so the reason the electrical and gas um, products are exempt is because they're already regulated under other legislation. So if those other things are only coming under the building, the building code, uh, then they are covered by the product information. Uh, we've got some um, specific kind of uh, examples here. I might we might leave actually until um, our third session. Uh, there was a question here from Murray that I would just like to bring up. Uh, we import window joiner from Europe. It's all custom made and bespoke uh, to every home. Is it enough to disclose information to client or does it need publishing on a public website for every house lot we bring in? Uh, and that would be somewhat sensitive information. I think most window suppliers tend to supply a system which would be a class two product. Uh, so yeah, often they're made simply, they've got the system, they know they can use these particular components up to a certain size in a certain wind zone certain configurations, those would be a class two product and covered by the requirements there. It would be a little bit rare for someone to completely design from scratch a new window for each building. If for some reason you are doing that, then it's probably not covered by the requirements. Um, yeah, Andrew, that's a good point because the, the window is actually a, um, it's, it's actually a system. Um, so it'll have, um, you know, it'll have specific details, but we'll be using um, common components, which are just fabricated to create an individual window. So in that case, the system is what you're saying would actually need to have a disclosure document um, rather than the actual specific window itself for that house lot. That's right. And that's essentially why the class two product requirements exist. They're for systems like that. Uh, yep. where they're all made from standard components and uh, have you know, limitations on just how they're used, but also the opportunity to change things to suit the particular requirements of the building within the scope of what yes. this can do. Uh, I've got a question here from Ray, and Ray, it's not stupid. Um, uh, we have we market a cladding product that gets fixed to a standard um, stainless fastener. Would the screws be included? So I'm, I'm going to open this up to um, thinking about, you know, the approach of a 
cladding system as opposed to a uh, cladding product like an individual weatherboard. Hayden, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, so yeah, so we, we, we are aware that there's some products that are intended to be used together as a system. So a system, in, in that case, a product information thing can be created for the system and you would just list the individual products on it. Um, I think in our guidance, we actually talk about that. I, can, I think it's could be around. Uh -huh. uh, uh, page 15. Uh, is that yeah, page 15. So the only caveat there is considering whether the, some of the components are intended to be used separately from the system. If they're all, if they're intended to be used as part of a system, like a spouting system where the join, the joiners are intended for a certain spouting profile and the downpipes, you can have one product disclosure for that whole, for that whole yeah. system. Okay, now I can see we've got a, a number of other product specific uh, questions here. Uh, as I mentioned in session three, we're actually going to we'll cover that off again. Um, we'll get the MB team back. I'd like to just um, finish by sharing our poll results. So uh, let's let's um, have a look at feedback from everyone. So how informed do we feel about uh, with regarding the BPIR? Uh, so we can see that. Um, I hope this session has been of value. Um, seems like we're, we're growing uh, in our understanding and interpretation of these new requirements. Um, majority of you having some understanding um, or a little. Um, so this one's interesting and it, it points to the questions that are coming through, uh, clarification around your particular products and how they fall under these regulations. Um, so a quarter of you are clear uh, rest of you are either not sure or do. So um, we'll we'll try and um, enable another session like this to be able to um, assist you with that uh, interpretation. How confident are you to have your documents ready by December? So a few of you um, uh, have got quite a bit of work to do. Some un, uh, and then really uh, it seems like there's a, a fair degree of confidence. Um, that unsure we should really take this um, poll um, once we complete session three and see if that uh, confidence has in fact uh, increased. Mm. Uh, right, so in terms of summary for today, the purpose was to actually bring us together, um, be able to go over quite specific questions that relate to us as the product supplier community around how we can best um, meet these requirements. I hope that we've uh, there's an understanding that the, if this information already exists in a document that meets all of these requirements, um, then hopefully this should be a straightforward job for you. Um, we've referenced the fact that there are some tools available, BPR Ready, which we'll send a link to shortly. There's consultants available in the market. And if, um, Lisa, if people actually have questions to, and want to correspond with MB directly, how do they do that? Yes, so we have a, a small team here at MB who are working in this area and we have our own um, inbox. So we um, obviously welcome you contact, contacting us through there. Can I just put a caveat on it that you do make sure you read the guidance first um, because it really helps to narrow down those questions. Um, and you can email us at products, P-R-O-D-U-C-T-S at MBIE dot govt dot nz and please do as in, um as gabriel said um get onto the website and subscribe because it really does help as we update when we're putting for instance further um resources on the site then we can actually you'll actually be alerted to things as they change and evolve so it's a really good idea to do that too yeah Thanks, Lisa. Um, I've just put up a final poll just to get your feedback on the value of today's session. So um, not only do we appreciate your attendance, but also some feedback around the value that you found for today. 
Um, and also um, going forward, if you've got uh, any feedback, uh, obviously Lisa's um, quite information to get in touch with uh, MB. If you've got any questions you'd like to relate um, to EBOS, we'll have um, contact details in the email that we'll send out shortly. Um, next week, um, you've got a little bit of prep work to do. So um, again, uh, we hope you enjoy using BPR ready start those um, initial steps for your disclosure document and we'll um, be here with John Gardner next Tuesday um, to go over those performance clauses and then we'll welcome back the MB team in our final session as we look to complete those documents um, and look at any product related questions that still remain. Thank you all um, for your attendance today. Um, all the best of the week and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again, Lisa, Hayden, uh, Andrew.